Hello everybody, I'm Anthony. Uh, welcome to the iOS Developer Meetup. So today we have a cool list of show and tell presentations. Uh, I think it's gonna be really cool to see what everybody in the community is working on. We got a good lineup of different startups, apps, tutorials, cool stuff that uh, people are gonna talk about. Um, so one of the, I think one of the most powerful things of the meetup is just getting to know the network of the community around Austin and all the developers. Uh, so I'm excited to uh, see what everyone's working on. Um, we just created a Facebook group a month ago. Um, so for the meetup, we stay connected via the meetup, via the meetup group, uh, regular emails, and then a lot of people are on the Facebook group sharing content, which is pretty cool. So I invite you to check that out. Uh, we also just started a mobile UI UX uh, Facebook group for kind of the design side. Since I'm mobile, uh, development and design is so tightly coupled. Uh, we we're sharing a lot of stuff on that group on the design side. Um, so I invite you to check that one out too. I'll see if I can throw up a Bitly link for that while people are presenting. I'll, I'll write it up here soon. Um, but uh, I want to say welcome. A lot of new faces I see here. So. You know, I invite everybody throughout the meetup and then after we'll have some time just to kind of hang out and you know, encourage you to network and you know, meet people in the community. Um, so, first one that we have up is Metro Rapid. Uh, I'll let him kick it off. And... How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Um, so, I just wanted to talk quickly about Metro Rapid. Um, it's an app for the Metro Rapid Bus, the 801 route mainly. Uh, basically made it by uh, reversing, reverse engineering their app, I guess. Uh, this is me uh, on GitHub. You can find the project there, it's all open source. Um, and this is what it looks like. Basically, the, the, the way you use it is you open it, it finds a stop closest to you, you click that stop, and it figures out the times and exactly shows you exactly where the bus is relative to you. Um, so uh, the, the way, the way uh, I, I went about uh, figuring out their API and how their app works uh, is basically just, uh, you, could, you could either use something like Sidecrypt, which lets you take apart a running app, um, or you can, in, in this case, their app is actually a web page, so I just uh, looked at the request that web page made and copied that. But uh, if I were to, so, uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, wanted to know what their bus passes are represented as, that QR code thing, you know, how it stores it internally, and how I can replicate them, uh, this is how you would hypothetically go about it. Uh, so Psycrypt is a tool. You need to be jailbroken to use it. Um, the way it works is you connect your phone to the same network as your laptop, um, open the app, SSH into the phone, Attach to our running process, and then you know just run commands inside of the app as it's running, and just pwn it basically. So uh, to get started, you SSH. Uh, just showing that we're inside the phone. Uh, find the open open the app obviously, and find the PID of the app you want to attach to. Um, so in this case, I want to open the Cap Metro Transit Authority app. Then we use Sidecrypt to attach that process, which is uh, the same number from here, uh, and start running commands in it. It's, it's literally just a shell you can run things, run things in. So uh, this command, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with what it does, it just animates hiding and showing the status bar. Um, uh, so uh, if, we, if we delve further into the app, we can find the app delegate, find the window, find the root view controller, which if you notice is CMTA root view controller. I don't know if you can see that in the back, but Camp Metro Transit Authority root view controller. So now we're inside of their code and we can interact with it. So we find this side navigation controller. If you use the app, it uses this side navigation thing. So it slides around and stuff. Um, we find the passes view. I actually, at this point, I actually opened the, uh, the active passes view Click that and uh, click. Uh, and and if, if we look at the side view controllers, children, the first one is the use passes view controller. And uh, uh, that pass group, uh, if, if we uh, just go down the path of looking at 
the different properties of these different elements. Uh, we go down the activation queue, active passes, etc., and eventually find the BM pass group. BM is a bike mark, the company that Cat Metro outsourced their app to. Um, and uh, that is not an activator, but if we, if uh, the way you use Cycrip is you, is you just put asterisk or whatever in front of the command, and it'll show you the properties inside of it. So if I do it, when I do that star around that, I get the representation of what a pass is. So if you see, there's the expir expiration date, the encrypted payload, uh, the device it's locked to, all sorts of cool and interesting things. <laughs> Had you been interested in <laughs> hypothetically using them? Um, so, uh, but that wasn't how I made the, the Cat Metro app. Uh, there's actually an easier way to do that. Right. The Metro app. Yeah. Um, turns out that some parts of their app look super crappy, and some parts of their app work awesome. You know, uh, which means that some parts are probably web views. <laughs> <laughs> so, I. Uh, Noticing that, I copied that phrase, enter an address, went to Google, typed in site, catmetro.org, enter an address, put that in quotation marks, and lo and behold, look at the second result. So we go to this web page, and let's actually do this right now and try out those requests. So uh, here I am at catmetro.org slash info. I open the Chrome developer tools, um, if you're using a Mac, which I assuming you would be in here. Uh, command option I. And uh, let's go ahead and type things into this. So we want to catch a bus from Republic Square Park. Go. Yeah. This is why I made my app. The, the thing is horrible. Find the one with the 801 route, click that. And if you notice over here, this one, this request, this, it's a post request, and it's to s underscore next bus to the ASP. And we can see the response. It contains a list of the next three times. And we can actually craft that response and get back data. But uh, if, there's actually another bug inside of their API um, if, where we can make that same request and uh, get back XML with the actual vehicle positions. So right now it's just JSON. And if I change that, that opt parameter from a number to lol or something like that, now it's XML. And there's actual latitude and longitude and vehicle positions. So this one is zero because it's not real time. See it better. Yeah. So yeah, that is how the app works. Um, so that's an undocumented API. Yes, it's extremely undocumented. <laughs> you, have to, you have to go find a lot of security holes in their API. So the way it's actually structured is there's a good solid API out there. That's that XML part. Except I don't know the IP address. I don't know how to reach it, um, etc. That the, the reason is. That API is being talked to by some ASP.NET server, uh, which takes the XML and turns it into like the next three times in JSON and returns only that. So found an ASP bug and exploit that, get to the real API. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at Ordoro, uh, this is kind of the stuff we do. We do a lot of stuff with web requests, et cetera. Um, uh, if you're a Python or Java, JavaScript developer, and Looking for a fun job, we're hiring. And uh, any questions? So basically, you're hacking into their API and you can pretty much use their API. Is that kind of um, in a way, I, I wouldn't say hacking into their API, I guess. Okay. It's just using their public API, the, the API that should be public. But do they say that their API is public? They don't so even know if it exists, exists to be honest. <laughs> the, the JSON API is public. Yes, their JSON API is public. Um, but I mean, I don't think they really know what they're doing, to be honest. Right. Right. And you're getting XML back through their JSON API by exporting it right now. Exactly. OK. Yeah. Uh, any other questions?
How many people here are jailbroken? One person? Two. Nice. Four. Sweet. You guys should jailbreak. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. UI Dynamics. Uh, you can I'm going to do some live coding. That seems dangerous. Proving it, and I'm going to show first of all the app that we built, and then also what I'm doing to make it better. So, so here is the app that we built at Hackathon, and what it does is it let, it's called Quest. It lets you create a quest for your friends, and uh, and what a quest is, is a, a, so, so a quest is a location, a secret location that, um, that you want your friend to go to, and the app gives them hints on how to get to the location. And uh, so you set, a, you set a destination by just touching on the screen, and and then you send it to them. And then the way that it looks like when they're on the quest is they, they just have a red button that um, tells, you know, a red button, when they click the button, it tells them how far away they are. And then they have to move somewhere else, and then they can touch it again and see how far away they are. And using those clues, they can figure out where they're trying to go. So this is an app that we're working on, and at hackathons, it's going to be a fun thing to release. But right now, it still looks kind of ugly. And, and so at the hackathon, we tried to do this form thing, and, but it didn't really work how I wanted to. And it, like, the UX is kind of bad. So it like, you don't really know how to close the screen. And so we, we tried to improve that. And so the improvement that I did, it looks like this. Here, the, it's like this. And here it's kind of obvious that there's you could click up here and, and then go exit out. Or if you play with around with a little more, you can notice that these things go up and down. So you can also just like dismiss it like that. And so the, the thing I'm going to demonstrate today is how to do like a jump in like that. <laughs> that looks like a really complicated animation, but all it is is telling the view to, to snap up to a point. So this is like three lines of code to like do that animation. And so I'm going to show, I'm going to do a live coding of how to do that from a brand new project. OK, so. OK, so we're going to do a new project. Um, and so this is going to be a login form app. All you do in this app is login. So let's make it so you can see. OK, so uh, we created this brand new project. And here we get a blank view. And so in this app, we're going to make a login screen that does some, some animations and jumping around. And so we're going to need a, we're going to need two labels, or no, not two labels, two uh, fields. 
or text fields. There we go. So we put in those two, and then we're gonna need a login button. So place those. And so, and so this is gonna be a login. Okay, cool, and then set some properties. This is username. And that's password, okay. Cool, so then uh, you have to link up this stuff to the view controller. So that's using the assistant editor. Drag over. Okay, so that, that's all the setup now, the boring stuff. Um, that just connected the views that I dragged in to the, to the code. And so now we're going to actually write the code that does this jumping. And all that code that we're gonna write, I'm gonna actually put into, um, I'm gonna make all that code trigger when you touch the button, so I still need to make one more connection, which is connecting this button to the view controller, or the clicking of the button. So that's uh, login button touched. Okay. So uh, in the app, when the person clicks login, this code right here is gonna run. And so um, these views in here, um, we that three views that we placed, we're gonna want them to be like objects um, in the sense of like physical, we want them to act like physical objects. We want them to be able to bounce into each other and, and, and have weight and things like that. And so to, to create that um, behavior, we have to have a um, animator, is what it's called. It's called a UI, dynamic, UI dynamics animator. So that we just have to add up here in the, in the interface. And so that's just UI dynamic. Okay. So uh, the way that UI dynamics works is you, uh, first you figure out what your objects are, then you create behaviors with those objects and behaviors are things like, um, don't leave the view that you're in. If you get to the edge, bounce off of it or, or a behavior could be gravity in a certain direction. So you give it a direction and then it'll, It'll know what to, it'll know uh, about gravity, and then all those different behaviors you can add onto one animator, and it will it will calculate um, what should happen in any instance. So you can add you can, and then you can also remove them. So you can add gravity, and then you can remove gravity. You can change the direction of gravity, all these types of things. And then, but all you're doing is just setting what your intent is. You don't actually have to do any of the calculations. And so we are going to do um, a collision first, a collision behavior is the first thing we're going to do. And we're going to make it a collision on the, the borders of the view so that um, our, lo our, login our login screen doesn't leave the screen or the view because then we won't be able to use it anymore. And so to do that, it, first you need to initialize the animator and that's and you initialize it with a reference view. A reference view is like the coordinate system that's gonna be used for the, the physics and also um, the, it has to be a super view of all the, the views inside of the uh, animations. So that's just gonna be self.view. And then we also, to make our lives easier for the code that we're gonna be writing, we're gonna make an array of the form elements that's so we can just have them all in one place. And so there's self.user, there's uh, username field, there's password field, and there's login button. So just put those together. 
And okay, so we got that set up. So the first thing, like I said, was the collision behavior. So that's just a UI collision collision behavior. Oh. UI collision behavior. We'll call it collision behavior. Okay, and so you just allocate it, and then you you initialize it with the items that you want this behavior to affect. So that's the form elements. And then you set one property, and that is the the um, translates translates reference bounds into behavior or into boundary. So reference bounds means the bounds of the reference view, which we defined up there as self.view. So that means the the boundaries of self.view will become boundaries for the animations. So that we just have to set to yes, and then we tell our animator to to add that behavior. Okay, so if we ran the app right now, it would ensure that our views don't leave the, the boundaries, but there's also nothing that tells the views to move, so it would just be a screen with nothing happening. So let's also add gravity into the equation. And so that's called UI gravity behavior. And and that's also so same pro same process. You allocate it and initialize it with the form elements, and then you you have to set a direction for your gravity. Gravity direction, and that is a vector. So it's a CG vector. So our gravity is going to be in the y direction. Okay, and then we add it. So then let's choose this and run it. And there we go. So that will make that fall. And there's gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, our graphics design would not approve. <laughs> so let's put in a pretty background image. <laughs> okay, so. so. When it fell, it tilted to the left side. Is that also? Um, that's because the button, the login button, the button okay. made it fall, hit like that. Yeah, yeah. So it was just down gravity. Yeah. So far. Um, and so let's, and so we're, we're, we're now going to make it kind of bubble up. So I'm going to put a, a water background behind it. This is on iOS 7? Yes. Yeah, so iOS 6, you can, can't do this. Okay, so, so we have it fall, fall down with gravity, and now we're going to wait for two seconds, and then we're going to make, we're going to reverse, or we're going to turn off, yeah, we're going to reverse gravity. So the way that buoyancy works is it's basically reverse gravity. So we're going to wait two seconds and then reverse gravity. So two second delay, and then we run this code. And that's going to be, so, and for, so we're going to do two things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take the username, we're going to tell it to snap to a certain position. So we don't actually want it to go all the way to the top, we're just going to tell it to go like almost all the way to the top. And then the other two, we're just going to tell it to float up. So they're going to float up and hit the username. So the way that you do that is, um, so the, the first, the snapping up to position is called a snap behavior. And, uh, and that one, you, Allocate, and you initialize with an item. So the self dot user field we're going to tell to snap to a point, and that point is 140, 100, and then we're going to put damping damping in there to uh, 
to make it look a little more natural. So that's just damping. And then uh, we're going to uh, tell our animator to, to add that behavior, the, the uh, snap behavior. And then we're going to tell it to remove behavior of gravity behavior. So that will make that will get added on. So we have that falling down, and then username popped up. Okay, so so let's make uh, gravity now reverse for the other two. And so that's going to be UI gravity behavior called gravity behavior. And it's going to, the cool thing is once you understand one of these, they all make sense. So init with items, and this is going to be form elements. OK, and then gravity behavior dot gravity direction cg vector. And so this one's going to be negative 1. And so we add that behavior, gravity behavior, and we run that. And so fall down, two seconds, pops up, flies back up. <laughs> you can log in again. There you go. And that's uh, that's how UI dynamics works. What I just want to make sure. Um, so there's gravity. There's this. There's also you can do um, friction between, uh, which gets interesting when you have collection views. You can have them like slide over and then like fall on to each other, and um, and and so there's uh, if you just look in the UI dynamics reference, they have a list of all of them. But um, you have to be careful with them that they don't get too annoying. So. <laughs> Because just because it's fun to program doesn't mean it's a good product. So I'm Francisco, and I'm uh, the developer behind Second Mic. And Second Mic is, imagine that you could watch a sports game on TV, but hear a different audio stream. So instead of listening to the announcers that are on TV, you can hear people that are experts, former players, celebrities, coaches, or just other fans basically giving the live commentary for the game. Well, now you can't because TV actually is a monologue. You only get one choice. You can watch the game on a bunch of different channels. You can stream it, but you're basically stuck with the live commentary that's on TV. And we're big sports fans, but we don't always like the people that we're listening to. Sometimes you just want to hear kind of 
your people from your home team kind of cheering you on on uh, your team. And so what we've built is a way for you to be able to kind of tune in and get alternative audio for your games. And the way it works is pretty simple. You go into the app and you're presented with uh, a bunch of different categories for the games that are on. So in this case, we had a, a March Madness game. We had the Kentucky versus Louisville game. And if you go in when there's, so right now we don't have any broadcast going, so I'm going to have to give you a video demo of what it sounds like. But uh, basically, you can select the channel, and there's no delay between the broadcaster and the listener. So really, as you're watching, you're hearing the audio for, for that event. And if, uh, if you want to broadcast, then it's equally simple. You have the ability to, with one click, you can basically become a broadcaster and start your own thing, and then other people can come in and listen. So the best way to show this is really So the audio actually is better in the real video. So the other area there should have been much better, but um, that's basically it. I'm happy to answer any questions. So basically, one user turns themselves into the announcer, and they can just stream wherever they want, and then anybody can find that stream and listen in? Yeah, yeah. right now, uh, not everyone can do it. So even on this phone that uh, I have here, I don't have the broadcasting enabled. Mm -hmm. But uh, but basically, people that come to us that have an interest in doing it will enable them. And then there can be up to three people that are basically <laughs> broadcasting for a game. Yeah. Cool. All virtually? Yeah, they can be in different places. So three devices, let's say. Who How comes does the server work? Sorry? How does the server side work? Uh, well, we have, uh, we're on Amazon Web Services. So we manage all of the voice backend ourselves. What's your traction so far? Sorry? Site traction. What is it with the app? So, so far we've logged 300 listener hours. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, launched our beta, I guess, six weeks ago. So basically I, as a normal user, can become a commentator instead? Yeah, that's the idea. And then, uh, you know, if you get enough people listening to you, then you kind of become popular and it's... Start making money. <laughs> eventually, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any trademark issues with like the sports? Uh, like, you know, they're really protective of their brands. So it's a bit tricky because uh, on one hand, we're not retransmitting the audio for, for the game. So it's basically, imagine that you're just getting a bunch of your friends and you're, you know, calling them and kind of going through the game. Uh, but, uh, it's kind of questionable whether even that actually infringes on, on their copyright. But there's been a lot of uh, cases in the past where, so for example, for fantasy baseball and that kind of thing, where if you're just using the facts to narrate a game, then you can basically defend that. OK, so like, do you know if it works? Like the radio stations, do they have to? Like if a radio station is like describing a game, do they, do they have to? Getting a lot, or you know, they have to get permission for it. Yeah, they, they, they do. 
Uh, but that's also related to the fact that it's over the air broadcast. So from a technical point of view, is it difficult to have like audio stream to one device? So it's hardest to get the latency down. Because if uh, if you have a lot of delay, then it kind of ruins it. You know, you're watching the game, and <laughs> the person like calls it a while after. Uh, so that's that's really the hard part. Does it? Is there some certain area of computer science which you have explored to like? Well, we push the codecs a lot, so we that's kind of our secret sauce: managing all the codecs to make sure that the latency is low. So right now, is it just one person broadcasting at a time? No, on per, some of these per stream. Yeah, well, it could be up to three. On uh, on that uh, Kentucky game, there was actually three people, and on a, on another one, there was two people. Got it. So like three people on the same stream, they can kind of talk back and forth, and yeah, that's cool. yeah, yeah. And then within the within the stream, you can also when you're listening to it as just a listener, you can't uh, kind of pick up the mic and, and talk, but there's messaging within the app, so you can like message the guy that's talking and be like. That was a secret call. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you decide which three people are actually doing the broadcast? So typically it's it's beforehand. So it's people that approach us and they say, hey, I want to do it, and I want to do it with my buddy. And so we kind of enable both of them to do it. But if you're the primary broadcaster on, on uh, the channel, you can basically invite other people. And so you'll get a notification saying like, hey, this person wants you to broadcast with them. And then you can do it. OK, I was just going to ask, how do you plan on monetizing this? <clears throat> so uh, in the future, we would expect that you can either do sponsorship of individual events or uh, like white labeling for big brands or teams or networks. But right now, it's it's free. It's no one gets paid. Well, and there was the previous question about the issue of copyrights. But the moment you monetize and you start pulling in revenue, yeah, then you then, then there's start to license additional considerations that you deal with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't think it's more of copyrights, but to something to do with network latency. You can't. I mean, the networks usually have a. Uh, Kind of cut off to like six seconds or eight seconds or something like that. Before which, even if you're on the radio, you can't really use that fax and say something. Well, the interesting thing is that the people that are providing the commentary, they're watching the same video that you are because they're not they're not professionals at, let's say, ESPN where they get the direct feed. And so it works really well if, let's say, you're watching TNT and actually when you set up your broadcast, you specify what channel you're watching on. And so people are going to have around the same delay. There are some differences between if, uh, let's say, you get a satellite or you get it by cable. But, uh, but that's kind of on the lesser end. Yeah, specifically, you've been seeing delays between HD and not HD. Yeah, there's also, there's also delays. There's also delays there. But it's kind of on the lower end. And what we're doing is we're building out a way where you can kind of adjust on the client side a little bit. So what, what is the current delay that you have it at? So right now, it's less than a second. So it's like 16 milliseconds. You do that by uh, modifying the codecs? Yeah. What's your team look like? Uh, it's four of us. been able to make any interesting connections in the sports or broadcasting world? Uh, so we might have some interesting folks uh, doing the final four, but we're not confirmed yet. So <laughs> download and check it. <laughs> <laughs> You're only allowing three streams at once currently, but probably be more in the future? Or? You could allow more, but the, the problem is that it also becomes a little bit chaotic. So. You know, allowing everyone to talk. Uh, for one, it, it's it's it kind of ruins the experience for the people that are listening, and then the bandwidth requirements go up to a point where you kind of lose a little bit of quality. Now, when you're talking streams here, like you could have multiple parties on different streams for the same game, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, it, 
Yeah, so basically uh, for one of the games, we actually had two people that were doing the commentary for, so you can have either multiple commenta commentators for the same, uh, on the same channel, let's say, or you can have multiple channels for the same event. So we've, and we've had both. Can you make it so I can selectively mute one of the <laughs> we haven't heard that request before. <laughs> cool. Great. Awesome. Hi, my name is John Woolsey, and I don't really have a presentation, but more of an announcement today. Uh, Media Tech Institute, which is uh, well known for jump-starting people's careers in the music and film business, is starting a new mobile applications development and web services program at their Austin campus. Uh, it's located on South Congress. So uh, the program is a 45-week program in semesters of 15 weeks each. And they are teaching uh, students how to uh, develop uh, both Android apps and iOS apps. Um, and the, with the web services aspect of it is kind of teaching people how to interface uh, their phones to, uh, to, the, to the web, uh, you know, APIs and, and things along those, that nature, and help students uh, get out there into the workforce. So uh, if you are interested, uh, please contact me after the, the meetup. Uh, and for the experts out there, they are also looking for an iOS instructor. Okay. So any questions up front? Is this the first time we're doing it? Or is this this, yeah. Oh, I forgot the date. It's, uh, it's May 5th. They're starting the program on May 5th. And so they have one in Houston that they've been doing, uh, but this is the first time in Austin. I was going to be the iOS instructor, but I had to bow out, so I'm trying to help them uh, along and try to find another instructor. Interesting. We're working on a similar thing. We're do at Jackrabbit, we're doing a, a class, but ours is more like weekend class, not, mm -hmm. not, as, in tech, not as immersive. Yeah, this is uh, very detailed. It's, a, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it takes you. Uh, the very first class is an intro to the iOS programming uh, in you know, a full 15 weeks. You know, and I've taught a class that kind of has about the same material in two weeks, but those were very bright students. <laughs> so so this, is, uh, this is more for you know, the folks that aren't necessarily interested in you know, a full-fledged CS degree from a major university, but you know, still want to be able to get that experience and get out there in the workforce because this is what they're interested in. Where'd you say it's being held? Uh, the, the classes? Yeah. Uh, Media Tech Institute, it's on South Congress. Uh, South Congress is in just a little south of Benway. They have a pretty nice facility over there. And they, uh, like I said, uh, they're very well known in the music and film industry. Uh, you see various uh, plaques and platinum records and such on their walls. It's pretty cool. What's the tuition like? Uh, tuition for that entire program is twenty-four thousand. Uh, they do offer uh, financial aid, but you know, there's a. It's kind of hard to really get in and, and understand the basics for, for some of these things. And you know, a lot of people come to these types of meetups and just try to glean whatever they can, and you know, get all glossy-eyed because you know things get over their head. And you know, this goes to the basics. That's the intent of it. You know, in fact. Uh, you don't really even need any sort of programming experience to start the program. They, they will teach you how to uh, program within the, the first course. So a lot of uh, parents are trying to get some of their kids in, into these classes. Any other questions? If you're interested in going or if you're interested in teaching, come see me afterwards. Thank you. Hey, so hello everyone. I'm Mike. My uh, inter it's not going to be quite as technical as David since my laptop's kind of on the fritz right now. But um, do any of you know possibly where I could take a laptop like the trackpad's kind of messed up where they wouldn't charge an arm and a leg? Uh, 
like short of the Apple Store. So my trackpad was messed up on my old laptop, and it, I, what I did was I, op I took out all the screws and opened the back, and like it was all full of dust. Oh, okay. And I cleaned that I out. That's problem. And like vacuumed it, and then I turned it back on and it worked again. I think some water may have gotten in there or something. Yeah. That could have been <laughs> <laughs> I, I would recommend a mouse. Yeah. yeah, I tried that too. It's still kind of messed up. But anyway, yeah, so I just want to talk a little bit about my journey to Austin and kind of what brought me here. Um, so I went to school at Michigan State, and I know we just lost to UConn. I didn't watch the game, but I heard there were some bad calls. Uh, but then after that, I decided, you know, I considered dropping out of college a bunch of times just because the classes didn't interest me so much, but I stuck to it, which taught me persistence. And then I decided, you know, to just pack everything in my car and move down here. And I mean, I've been happy so far. I just interviewed at Apple out in Cupertino. Uh, makes me wish I'd play, paid more attention to those boring algorithms classes. But uh, yeah, so I just decided, you know, to stay here in Austin. And um, kind of, this is where Do 512 came in, into play, and just finding my own clients doing a lot of freelance work. And uh, Do Words My Car as well, which is my main startup. And the idea for that mostly came from, I had just, I was new in Austin, I was looking around for my, uh, trying to find my way around town. And I thought, you know, there should be an app for this. So I, it's such a simple concept. I looked on the app store and just figured yeah, I can I can improve on this easily. So that's what I did. It's being used, you know, all over the world right now, about 30,000 users. Um, and then this Do 512 app, which I'm sure many of you for, are familiar with the website, it helps you find concerts, you know, fun things to do in Austin. They're in about nine cities right now. Um, so I found, uh, a friend introduced me to the founder and I decided, you know, I can, I tried to have it up there before South by Southwest, but it just didn't happen. Um, but um, yeah, I'd like to demo it real quick if I can. I'm not seeing the uh, airplay on my phone. Connected to So, uh, do you want to talk about the? Well, I figures out the the dude where's my car? What that does? Yeah. So, uh, dude where's my car? It helps you easily. Say you're you're new to a city, maybe you're driving a rental car or something. You're not familiar with the area, so you park. You just bring up the app. There might be ways eventually of uh, you know with the iPhone 5s it has a core motion API where it will know whether you're driving or walking, so it can do that automatically. But right now, you have to remember to mark your location, get directions back with Apple Maps, like a trail of breadcrumbs, essentially. And then that's what it started out as, and people started using it. So then I started adding other features that might be useful, like finding taxis, parking lots. Um, the parking lot is actually a, a free database that's open and available up there called Streetline. So you just bring that in, and then for the taxis, I'm just I'm pulling, I'm using an API connected up to Yelp and pulling in all that information. <coughs> so you can easily call them and then find nearby places. So I think the recording is something that's going to put the. Oh. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. So that's the There we go. Cool. Um, so yeah, the this is dude where's my car. This is start out. And you know it's it's undergone some recent UI improvements. Uh, so it has a slide out menu now with all of the the options here. And after the this is to it's an in-app purchase. After they use each of the features three times, I want to get them using it, and at least so that they can test it out. And then it will say, uh, you know, you got to pay 99 cents to keep using it. So I actually can't demo these features right now. <laughs> Those are the things it can do when it works. Um, you just this is just. One. Uh, sure, but which one? 
the so if I tap pipe park car, you can uh, it would bring up a, a view where you can mark your location. There's a little talent for us where we check in and it just places a little car right there and you can get directions back whenever you from wherever you are. Um, and then the, the thing in the middle is a button which is now disabled. But you normally you'd be able to click on that and it would take you to the view. It'd be cool if you have an icon in your car and it'll tell you how far away from your car you are. Yeah, I actually have, there's a company based in Tampa, Florida, I think, called Car Voyant. I was out in San Francisco and he gave me a device that plugs into the OBD port of the car. So it can know, um, it sends data to the cloud and knows everywhere your car is. Does Apple uh, so say forbid that? that? They used to forbid fleet management type stuff. Uh, it's it's just something I have in my car. Oh, okay. It's not being actively you used to it. No, but um, say say your car gets broken into, as mine did actually in San Francisco, it bashed my window in. Uh, but it, if it got stolen, then you could alert the police that this is exactly where it is. Let me just show you do 512. What's going on here? It's not actually up on the App Store yet, but it will be soon, hopefully. So it's just pulling from the JSON. You can tack on .json to any page on do 512, and it will um, display all the data. So I have a list here, I can scroll through it, check to see what's going on, and then click on any one of these, you get more information, buy tickets, of course. Uh, pretty bare bones right now, there's a slide out menu, you can pull out and see some other information. Uh, no Facebook login or anything yet, but that's coming. And then you have a, a map of all the venues nearby, you can click on it, see who's playing there. Uh, you'll notice there's a little dude where's my car icon right down there. So, could be some kind of partnership there. Uh, <laughs> and then here, uh, here's the venues as well. So you can scroll through pretty, pretty basic stuff. You can, you know, look at all the artists. I would have liked to have had the, oops, wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Needs some more bug testing, but yeah, that's that's the basics of it, and it should be up there in a few months. When you hit buy tickets, where does it take you? It will just take you to a web view inside the app, right there. Cool. You can easily just buy right inside the app. What's your back end? Um, there isn't one right now. Just uh, connecting and getting all the JSON data and parsing it on their website. Mm -hmm. So it's basically replicating what they have already on the website. And then, yeah, that's. I uh, can also search. Search will bring up all the the venues where Stop is playing. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all I got. They'd be cool if you integrated with like the calendar. They like say add to my calendar or something. Sure. Yeah, that's probably a future goal. Yeah. Thank you. Up. All right, very good. So I'm Moshe from GeoSafe, and what our startup does is we do in-car police law enforcement tracking. So that's a police car right there with an iPad mounted in the cabin. 
uh, at the bottom there, they have the lights and sirens and that kind of fun stuff. But uh, let me just show you the app. So I'll switch over to that. Did that come up? OK, good. So what we're looking at is live 911 call information in Oklahoma. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit, and we'll take a look at some of these calls. If I click on one of these pins, you can see the, uh, the type of call that is. So since it has a shield, it is a police call. And this one with the flame is a firefighting call. If I tap on that call, I can read all the information about that call, where it's at, uh, what time it came in, and all the dispatcher notes. So whenever you're on the phone with the dispatcher at 911, they're typing up all this information. So we can see someone fell off the top of a truck, 43-year-old male, and so on and so on. I can see that there's one unit there, and they uh, were dispatched at 720 and got there on scene at 730 and then got to the hospital around 8 o'clock. This is a public app. This is obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> so this app is for law enforcement, uh, firefighting, and EMS use only. Where do you get this information? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So each one of these circles is the location of a police car. So that's a Midwest City uh, police officer. I can go down into more. We can see uh, there's more police. There's a more firefighter. If I keep zooming in, we can see there's engine three and brush pumper three. If I switch over to satellite mode, we can see that they're parked out in front of the, uh, the fire station. These little red dots are uh, the hydrants. Say that again? This is happening right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is live. So this is not public information, obviously. This is internal, but they allow me to demo it for these purposes. <laughs> uh, if I keep zooming out without tilting that, we can go see what's going on in Norman. I know that's not very popular here in Austin. Uh, <laughs> here's the OU campus police, as well as the Norman Police Department. So all these agencies, they have their own 911 call systems, but since they all use GeoSafe, we're able to bridge that information together. And this is what they use to coordinate their activities. So when there's a large scale, uh, let's say, tornado like there was in Moore, you could actually see all these uh, units coming in and pouring into the city more to help out with search and, uh, search and rescue. So on the left-hand side, we see a bunch of calls, and they're also separated by the cities. So let's take a look at a Norman police call. Here's a fire electrical fire. And again, you can see some arching. Let's see what else we got. Trespassing. So you can see the person who called 911, as well as uh, the dispatcher notes. What's the existing alternative? Yeah, so typically you have a big, bulky, uh, ruggedized laptop inside the, uh, I don't know, you have that? Uh, inside the laptop, inside the car. So they're switching out to iPads just because they're less expensive iPad's about $500, $600. A uh, Panasonic Toughbook is about $5,000. So it's a pretty big savings for uh, the agency. Is the map data all just Apple Maps? Yeah, so the, uh, the base map is Apple Maps, but the uh, positioning of the calls comes from their 911 call center system. So even if the street is not on there, it'll still uh, be placed in the correct and, spot. And the satellite view as well? Satellite. It's just, just like on uh, Apple Maps. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you run into any memory issues with displaying that many annotations? <laughs> um, a little bit. On, on iPad 2, it can be difficult. We actually don't do any clustering yet. Hasn't been that much of an issue, but I have noticed it if you're not careful. Yeah. Did you create this entire thing on your own? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so I started this company about four years ago while I was in grad school. And now I'm trying to hire iOS developers so that I can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there was a question about the data. Someone asked me about that. You did. So I integrate with each of the uh, call centers in each city. I have a little Windows uh, service that's pulling from their database and pushing it out to the cloud. How does the new data come into the app? Yeah, uh, so it's basically pulling. I created this backend API, this internal API. It's downloading new JSON every 10 to 15 seconds. I saw a red dot just pop up on the map. Yeah, so maybe uh, somebody uh, logged in or they lost connection temporarily and came back on. 
Uh, the colors indicate their status. So red means the officer is busy, green means they're available, blue means they're on the way to something. So the police or fire have some kind of transmitter that's constantly sending their location to their 911 service? Yeah, they have an iPad in their car, and so that's the iPad, it's the the iPad itself. Well. Yeah. Okay. There's also a version for iOS or for iPhone, and uh, I'll switch that on right now. What is the police currently using? Uh, yeah, they use both iPad and iPhone. Is this left? I guess. So, for instance, the campus police, since they're usually not in their cars when they're walking around OU, they just pull out their iPhone. So they get all the same type of information. You can go switch to the map, see the same type of data. We basically have feature to feature uh, uh, equality, yeah, parity. Do you do any encryption or any? Oh, yes, of course. So uh, because it's a law enforcement application, you have to actually encrypt it to a certain level. It's a FIPS standard. It's a federal standard for uh, transmitting law enforcement information. And since it's also used in the medical field, there's also the HIPAA level type of encryption. So the law enforcement is using your solution? Now? Yeah, there's about 15 cities in Oklahoma. I'm actually from Oklahoma, but I just moved to Austin last week. Congratulations. So, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, let me switch that back. Was so it hard get... to get the data from them initially? How was that? Converted? Yeah, the very first customer, of course, was the most difficult. Uh, but once they saw it, then they were like, awesome. I, then I just got cities after cities because they all talk to each other. Police talks to the firefighter next door, and then they do a lot of mutual uh, 911 activity. So yeah, it kind of spread on its own. Yeah. So, so you have a background. You have a, you have a server that pulls from their servers, and then your app talks to your server. Yeah, I have a uh, service that's installed at each site, and it's streaming data to our backend. Our backend is Windows Azure, so not like it's kind of like Amazon, but it's Microsoft's version of that. And then I talk directly to my mm -hmm. back. Right. But, but then the location information you're pushing and just showing here, or is that get pushed up? Yeah, so each client pushes their GPS data to our server, and then it's broadcast to everybody else again. Just in your application, or do they That's need that correct. also for other? So back in Dispatch, there's actually a Windows version of this as well. They have it on one of their screens. In Dispatch Center, you have usually nine screens or six screens. So they put up GeoSafe on one of the screens so they can see where everyone is at. That's right. Yeah. I'm just curious about how you got started with this idea and then how you took it into the first customer. Yeah. Um, so I was an undergrad at OU. And it kind of started off as a research project with my professor. And uh, the kind of catalyst of this idea was there was a big tornado and more just like the one we had. And at the time, nobody could communicate. All the radio towers were down. It was kind of chaos. And command and control is a big deal in those types of situations. So the original idea was just to create a chat system for police. And that materialized itself into this application. Um, the, uh, the OU Police Department was very nice. They let us guinea pig with them, and once we got them, Norman police signed on as well. As far as what your market looks like, I'm aware that there's a lot of, um, I don't know if you'd say that they're competitors or not, but social listening uh, platforms where they aggregate like Twitter, Twitter feeds yeah. and Facebook and posts and all these different social listening platforms, and they try to sell that to police. agencies yeah. as a way to kind of get a, uh, feel of what's going on in the ground during a disaster, for example. Or right. Like um, I guess what I'm curious is, you know, how does this compare against that? Do you, uh, do you find how the agencies are responding to? Like, uh, well, we can see what they're actually doing versus just what they're listening to. Uh -huh. uh, we're doing a little, like, I'm tracking their GPS and logs. That's for them, but I can do some analytics on top of that. So I can actually see if a police department is getting enough coverage uh -huh. on their city. So that's kind of an interesting thing to see, like, you know, uh, Norman is pretty wide. They, it goes all the way out to the lake there. Uh, but they usually only have one or two officers patrolling that area. Right. But they think that's OK because of the population density. But yeah, the tweets, I, I don't know. Of course, you can integrate. Uh, some things I'm not, I'm showing you, not didn't show you yet, is the query tab. But I think you could integrate that. 
Very well. Yeah. <laughs> and it would make yours for a superior. Sure. Yeah, third party data sources are really easy to add to the yeah. system. Uh, here, I'm actually going to do a query for you guys. Hopefully, this will uh, come back. This data that I'm going to show you is actually public, so don't worry. Uh, so whenever you get pulled over, the officer uh, looks up your name or your license, and uh, here we're getting a couple of hits from three different data sources. So it could be an additional data source, like Twitter. Here we're looking at the Oklahoma Department of Corrections and the Sheriff's Office. We're looking for warrants to see if we need to arrest you whenever we pull you over. Uh, here's Barbie Smith. So that's a beautiful mugshot. And uh, this is actually someone who's already in, in jail. So we can see um, she was in possession of a controlled substance. <laughs> Conviction 2008, and she's actually already out, 2010. So yeah, we're building these tools for them based on their feedback, and it's uh, it's exciting. Yeah. Go ahead. How do you handle indoor? Inside. Inside. Uh, like for example, who so use a big car? So obviously, a lot of. Car is yeah, um, they're usually not inside. They're in their cars or on a bicycle. So they usually leave the iPad or iPad mini in the, uh, in the case of the bike. So they're not actually going inside the buildings with their equipment. So what kind of MDM like, do you have? For instance, if someone took one? Yeah, so each agency actually manages their own devices. So they have their own MDMs. Uh, different agencies use different vendors. We have a couple of things on the back end too where we can disable a device so it just won't work or we can disable a user as well. So there's multiple levels of uh, security. Yeah. Uh, cheapness. <laughs> uh, really, um, it has the worldwide coverage. That was just the best. I didn't have to worry about it. Um, I looked at the Mapbox API. I like it a lot because it allows me to change the colors. Nighttime driving is an issue. Uh, it's really bright in the cabin. Uh, on the Windows version, I'm actually able to, I use Bing Maps for my uh, back, for my map, and I can change the colors there, but so far, uh, just Apple Maps right now. So just, uh, you mentioned Bing Maps. Are you on multiple platforms? Uh, just iOS and Windows, yeah. What sort of, um, if any, um, technical or algorithm knowledge is needed to, you know, aggregate the sort of, um, you know, positioning data? Is yeah, um, it's not that technical as far as uh, algorithms go. Uh, it's a lot of polling. We're, uh, it's the most reliable thing because the network, especially when you're driving, kind of just cuts out. So it doesn't make sense to have a web socket connection or anything like that. We're just it's like a JSON API. Every time you ask for a new request. Right, but, but like your devices are mm -hmm. giving positioning uh, location again and again. So it's, I guess they're always connected to the car charging or something. But That's true. Kind of intensive on the battery, right? Yeah. Uh, so when I submitted this app to Apple, they even though it's a private app, it still had to go through the approval process. And that's something they made me add to the description that it can uh, kill your battery. But you're right. It's always plugged in directly into the vehicle's yeah, power. <laughs> I wouldn't say anyway. <laughs> Not that I know. We need to get some counties on board in New Orleans for the next hurricane control. Yeah. Hopefully, that. anytime soon. I'm uh, yeah. in two weeks, or actually, no, on Sunday, I'm going down to Galveston for my first trade show here in Texas. So hopefully, I'll start getting some Texas customers, and then I can hire some iOS devs. That'd Where's be good. What does your team look like? Uh, it's just me. Yeah. Cool. You're doing sales, marketing, iOS, yeah. Windows. Yeah. Windows. Windows, I do it all. <laughs> Support. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been avoiding Android because of that issue. Uh, <laughs> I get a lot of requests for Android, and I'm just, I don't want to mess with it until I get somebody else. Question? Yeah. Were you at WWDC last year? I was. Yeah. yeah. I remember this. Uh, uh, I was right behind you with uh, huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I'm going to try to go again this year. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Any other questions? So, do you have a business model in place now, or is it still? Like yeah, I mean, we're. I mean, I'm profitable, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I sell on a flat rate basis, so every city pays like a subscription fee, kind of like Netflix. Every year, they just re up if they want to continue to use it. 
Uh, it's been kind of nice since there's now 10, 12 cities using it. Nobody wants to leave because then they get, they're not in the network. So they kind of bully each other to stay in. <laughs> but it's not that expensive. I'm uh, setting it at 15,000 a year. So we'll see. Bigger the city, the higher the, uh, the rate. Yeah, and you're providing a level of interoperability that they didn't have before. That's correct. So, so you can see the one next door. Yeah, uh, so about existing competition, uh, the 911 call centers provide their own mobile platform, but they only work with their own products. Whereas the Geosafe, I work with everyone's products and I'm able to link them all together. So I don't really care that this is one 911 call center and this is another one. I'm able to bring it all together. Are you having to do custom integration though at that point where we have that Windows service is born? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So each one of these call centers, they're all basically backed by MSSQL. Uh, a little bit of custom integration. I've kind of created a, a plan how to do each one. But you have an onboarding process. Do you have like a flat fee to onboard a city? Yeah, so the way I do that is I give them a free trial for three or four months, and that gives me the time to make that interface. And they think they're getting something free out of it, but I'm also not having this fire of, hey, make it work, make it work, make it work. So I can gradually build that interface and make it make sure it's stable for them. And they appreciate that too, because most of uh, these vendors, they usually charge them so much money about uh, every single interface. I've heard $25,000 in interface. Like, that's what other companies charge. I just think that's just crazy. So if you were to add Austin, for example, that yeah. means you'll have to do some... Uh, so, so your servers will need to talk with some... Whatever call system they have. I mean, I've integrated Austin. with, I think, nine different companies, so we probably have already hit them. Yeah. Yeah, like we just did Oklahoma City. That, that's probably what Austin uses, the same company. There aren't that many CAD vendors. Thanks, guys.